So 99.999% of the chickens in the U.S. and in developed countries are raised indoors in what's called a barn, so a grow house. 600 feet long, 40 feet wide, 40,000 so birds inside of there. You know, you've seen the pictures. Like, that's what it looks like. That's your sort of standard chicken barn. You take a door at the very end of that house and you open it for two hours a day. You know, the chickens aren't going to go outside, first right. of all. They're meat birds. They want to stay close to the feed and the water and the shade. Yep. So no matter what, it's 110 degrees outside, Fresno, you know, no food or water or shade out there. As long as you open that door, though, they had access to the outdoors. So now that's free range. Hey, everyone. I'm Andy Petronic. And this is episode 151 of the Andy Petronic Podcast. This is where I talk to innovators, leaders, and high achievers in the areas of health, fitness, and well-being with the intention of filling your bucket with knowledge, inspiration, and strategies to experiment with, learn from, and to ultimately lead your best life. Yes, yes, yes. I am uh, really grateful that you guys are here, uh, that you're that you're tuning in, you're continuing to choose this podcast of all the podcasts out there you could pick from that you're tuning in here. And um, I'm really excited about my upcoming guest. His name's Paul Grieve. He's the founder, owner of Pasture Bird, which is a sustainably farmed chicken farm. It's the largest of its kind in the United States. I want to get a couple things out before I... Uh, go right into the introduction of him and his what the what the podcast is going to be about. The first thing and the most important thing actually is the whole life challenge starts on September 29th. Now, this is our fall challenge. It's the usually the second biggest of the year, the biggest being in January. And the fall is a great time to get back to business. We we give people a chance, especially those with kids, to let the kids get back to school, kind of get back into the swing of things before we start. And we get it done before the big holidays, before Thanksgiving, before um, winter break, Christmas, New Year's. Um, And it makes it a great time to just get right back down to business. And I'll tell you what, I speak for myself. I did the summer whole life challenge and it was was good, but it, it was hard. Uh, given that it was summer and I, I can really use getting back on the stick. Now, I, I mean, I do every whole life challenge and um, I do it because it serves me. If it didn't serve me, I wouldn't do every, every one. I, I, I promise you, I w- if it was kind of a waste, if it was a waste of my time, I would never participate the way I participate. I learn something new from every single whole life challenge that I do. And I love the six week on six week off format for my life because it, it, I rest assured knowing that I've got accountability coming up that I can, I can completely go off the rails, which I don't, but I I could and know that I've got another upcoming whole life challenge to take care of business again, where I'm accountable and responsible and I'm doing the work. You know, one of the things that we talk about in the challenge is this isn't, it's not supposed to be easy. It's simple. It's not hard in the sense that we're not asking you to go out and lift, you know, back squat 300 pounds or, you know, do the handstand walk for 100 meters. We're, we're asking you to do simple things each day that will have a profound life-changing impact on your life over the course of years. So um, I invite you to join me. My team's name is called Springing Forward. I think I have an exclamation point on the end of that. I know it's fall, and I know we actually fall back and fall, but the hell if I'm going to name my team Fall Back. I don't fall back. I don't fall back in anything that I do. I spring forward. I move forward. I take a step into the unknown, into the chaos of the unknown. And although I know what the whole life challenge holds, there's always unknown. There's always things that come up that 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 um, challenge me. So join me. Uh, it's a team for listeners of the podcast, for people that know me, friends and family, and um, we're 
I'm, I'm doing a, putting a little twist in it this time. If you're on the team, you've got to be on Facebook because I'm going to add you to our secret Facebook group and you're, I'm going to be expecting you to share video. Uh Oh, share video of yourself talking about yourself, sharing, sharing who you are with the other members of the group of it's private. It's secret. can't be shared anywhere else. And if that is too confronting for you, then sorry, this isn't the right team. I still invite you to do the whole life challenge. Uh, but if you're up for it, up for pushing yourself past maybe what might come up as uncomfortable for you, then uh, then join. It's called springing forward. You got to register first, and then uh, once you register and get in the challenge, you can join my team. Springing forward. So I hope to see you there. I've got a couple really cool guests coming up on the podcast, uh, in- including next podcast. I'm I'm not publishing them every week. It's usually about every 10 days. Uh, the next podcast will be Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. She goes by the paleo mom. Don't let that name fool you. She's one of the most knowledgeable resources, researchers in the area of health and nutrition uh, than of anyone that I know. Uh, and not just anyone that I know. She's actually well-respected in the world of nutrition, health, ancestral health, paleo. And uh, she's She's incredible. So um, she's coming up next. But let me get right to today's guest. His name, again, is Paul Grieve. He, he runs a company. He runs the largest organic, sustainably sourced, free-range chicken farm and real free-range, real free-range chicken farms in the United States. They have over 50,000 birds. His business started I don't know, not that long ago with 50 chickens in the backyard and it has grown to what it is today. And it all came about because of his, his and his family's frustration with labels and how they weren't able to find actual real free range chicken, or they weren't able to trust the labels in the store because you could go to Whole Foods and you could find free range and you could go to Walmart and find free range. And it, he explains the difference. In fact, um, we talk quite a lot about the difference between you know, the, the, the government's requirement for labeling free range and the difference between what he does and what they do. It's unbelievable what, what he's up to. Uh, and, you know, hopefully in this story, now he, he's a local in Southern California. Uh, he has a lot of big uh, corporate customers, including the Dodgers and the Lakers and um, – or some of the other people he works at Wolfgang Puck and Morton's and Mastro's and you can order direct from him, uh, which is kind of cool, but his, the primary, his primary business is local here in Southern California. But here's the thing I, I really want you to get from this is you can find these kinds of farmers and, and produce and, and, uh, chicken and beef all over the country. You just have to search for it. You just have to look for it. We talk about that, the importance of knowing where your food comes from, knowing the name of the farmer maybe, or or knowing just their reputation and being willing to shift your, your resources, your valuable, the money that you earn, putting more of it toward improving the quality of the food that you eat. It It doesn't, it takes a commitment more than it takes money or, or more making more money. And uh, we talk about that too. So I'm not going to go on. I'm just going to bring him in. It's a great conversation and I look forward to hearing what you think. Here we go. Welcome, Paul Grieve. We are live on YouTube with uh, Paul Grieve of Pasture Bird. Hey, thanks for having me. Welcome. It's great to have you. Yeah, same. Excited. I, I it, well, obviously, I've been excited to have this for a while. Last time, last time, it didn't work out. The schedule, the schedule gods didn't. Uh, I don't know what happened. It just happened that way. No big deal. Well, we will get you down to the farm within the next I, couple. I months cannot I wait to, to come out. I can't wait to come out there because I love what you guys have going on. Absolutely, man. I took. Uh-huh. I have one experience taking care of chickens when I was. Uh, God, I think it was in eighth grade. We moved into a a really good friend of my mom's uh, went to Nova Scotia for the summer and they went away for two months 
And we, my mom agreed to move into their house and take care of their chickens. And they had about 50, <laughs> about 50 chickens. And uh, the only thing I really remember from it, it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, there was, it wasn't that hard work because they had it all kind of dialed in. But oh, there, yeah. there was one chicken that was, that, that, that was, I don't know if it was a chick when we got there or what, but it, it grew, it, it got older as it was, as it was getting older, it was growing this deformed foot and the foot was all big. And like my, my mom, like thinking like a normal person would like every baby matters, <laughs> we got to figure out what's wrong with this chicken. So we went into, we went into town, we went to the veterinarian, we tried oh, to figure yeah. out what's wrong with this chicken. And I, I think the chicken actually died. I don't really remember, but um, you know, there, you get a lot of, you got a lot of chickens to take care of. You, you might not have to take care of them like a human does with their baby. Yeah. yeah. We might, we might've taken care of that one a little bit differently. <laughs> <laughs> How many chickens do you guys have? Right this second, I got 50,000 chickens out on pasture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a whole different deal. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We still care about each one just as much, but yeah, we take care of those ones a little bit differently on the farm. You don't, you don't name them all, do you? Oh, yeah. Every single one's got a name. Wow. And you keep track of them. Like Future you. dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Are, do, you, do you guys have layers and... Uh, uh, what, I don't even know what you call them. A bro- you call them a, a meat chicken. It's called a broiler. So you call a meat chicken. Or, but no, we're mostly a broiler farm. So we do mostly meat chickens. Big fan of layers and stuff. We have about 200. But uh, our main business is definitely selling fresh meat. Hilarious. You know what I did? Forgot to hit record on my podcast recorder. <laughs> so, so it's going Dude, on YouTube. But now we're going on. Like, I've done like two podcasts where we figured that out at the end and it was horrible. oh god yes uh, that's happened to me one time i've done 200 almost two uh, no 150 episodes and uh, that happened to me once so it's almost just it's like worse. dude we can't even try to do this again yeah, it's right. like trying to rewrite an essay that you lost like it's just not gonna be the same totally totally i did i did it once before where i recorded on youtube and i forgot to press the record on my on my recorder uh-huh. so i so we were able to grab the video the audio from youtube it's not as oh, good yeah. not as good but you know it worked right, right, right. thankfully so um <laughs> 50,000 chickens. Now, I just got to ask you this question because, um, you know, a lot of people don't know why we're even talking right. or anything about what you do. Obviously, they know you're a chicken farmer, uh, I think, at this point. Uh, I don't think that, that 50,000 chickens is not a hobby. That's no, that's no longer a hobby. That's no longer. <laughs> what point does it become not a hobby? How many chickens? Yeah, that's a good question, man. I'd say once you're like taking, you know, your family's income is coming from the farm and you've got employees yeah. that depend on that, it's really not a hobby anymore. You know? What at what number was that and how long ago did that did that occur for you guys? So we kind of started with fifty chickens in the backyard, you know, kinda of like your grandma did. Yep. And uh we had that and we just basically grabbed those for ourselves and our family. It was a joke. We're joking around about getting chickens, kind of tired of the free range, kind of fake labels, all that stuff. And we said, oh, yeah, let's just get 50 chickens and like raise them for ourselves just as a a hobby. What do you mean you got tired of the the labels? Like, tell me about that part of the. Oh, dude, we'll get into it, man. But let's put it this way. As a a summary overview, a free range chicken, usually they've never been outside. An antibiotic free chicken has probably had antibiotics its whole life. Uh, an organic chicken looks the exact same as the factory farm pictures that you see in the store. You know, hormone free, cage free, all that stuff. It's it's all BS. Like it's insane. Really? It's so bad now to the point where it's just an I- intentional deception. And yeah, you, know, you got hardworking families trying to do right by their kids and feed them the best food, and uh, and they're just taking advantage of loopholes in the labeling system. So we just got fed up with it. We got sick of it. And we started following this guy called Joel Salatin, who's a farmer out of Virginia, and just yep. geeking out on his stuff. And did you learn about him an from? Job. Did you learn about him from uh, Michael Pollan's book, or did you? Yeah, I mean that's where he kind of made his name for yep. sure. Omnivore's yep. Dilemma, and he was also at the end of Food Inc. And that was a pretty hard hitting documentary for us of just how bad the system's really gotten. And so we'll get into this stuff, but I'm as I'm as against factory farming as anybody else, yep. you know, that's listening right now. So I want to make that clear right up front. I'm not pro meat i'm pro meat done the right way right um but it's just we just got so sick of it and we tried we, we ordered 50 chicks completely naive i mean i grew up in downtown seattle i had no idea what i was doing <laughs> put them outside <laughs> raised them the way we thought it should be done what were, what we were didn't you doing, know any better what were you doing for a living at the time what were you what was i was your... an accountant yes i was actually cpa 
Wow. And I, I had gone to CPA from a military. I was an officer in the Marine Corps before that, and then a college athlete before that. So it was like this crazy journey already. Right. And all my friends are like, dude, are you freaking kidding? Like, <laughs> you're going to do it. Now you're going to be a farmer. Okay. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. So it was a family affair, though, man. And my whole family just jumped in head first, and we got these birds, and we thought we were going to raise them for ourselves. Um, and I put a couple posts up on Facebook and people were getting excited and putting down deposits. And so all 50 birds sold out before we even harvested them. Wow. Um, and my family was all pissed at me because they didn't have any chicken to eat, you know? So then the next time we did a hundred and then 200 and then 500 and a thousand. And did you just, did you just happen to poultry company around? Did you just happen to have land available? Like were you out? No, no, not at all. So we started on, uh, on my in-laws had about, uh, a quarter acre in their backyard. Okay. And we actually grew, you know, a six figure business just right there in their backyard. We were doing farm tours and people driving down from LA to see this little backyard with some chickens and sheep in it and stuff. And wow, we cut our teeth with nothing, dude. We funded the business with $2,000 total and we didn't have extra money. So we just put it in and we said, you know, if it, if it takes, it takes, we're not going to put any more money into this thing though. And we didn't want to take any debt. So it was just nine of us living in a 1700 square foot house at one point. Wow. Didn't take a salary and worked full time for two years and just yeah, you know, it was the American dream a little bit. Did um why chickens? Like what was it just because it was easy? No, chickens really complicated actually compared oh. to beef and lamb. You know some of your other red meats. I think chickens actually a lot more complicated in certain ways. So we started with everything. We have a company called Primal Pastures. It's an e-commerce. Uh, pasture raised livestock company and we started with beef lamb chicken pork mm. fish and we just wanted to like we just wanted to provide good food for people you know and stuff that you couldn't find in the grocery store and we started raising all these different kinds of animals and sort of like looked at our climate and what was available in the stores and what wasn't available in the stores and like i don't know about you but we can find good grass-fed beef a lot of places now yeah it's all over the it's all over the internet you can find yep. it like in the grocery store and whatnot but pasture raised chicken was like nowhere to be found and we just looked at small amount of land that we had wasn't going to support a big herd of cows um, but you can do a lot of chickens on a small piece of land and then the turnarounds we didn't have any money so like we needed to be able to turn around animals in 10 weeks not two years right um and so that worked really well for us and then the climate in southern california so we're south of la and north of san diego and it was really ideal for raising chickens outside 12 months out of the year so all those things lined up and we're like pointing us towards chicken and we're having good success with it. So we're just like doubled down on the chicken thing and taking it from there. We're, um, did you go through a, a phase of trying to figure out how you wanted to do it? Like how you wanted to raise them and like, kind of like what we did was, you know, when we're trying to deal with one little chickie at a, at a time, like how did you manage that and negotiate that? I mean, it was like, OJT, they call it the military on the job <laughs> yeah. training. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. just make mistakes and you learn, you know. Uh, farming, what's cool is it's pretty instinctual. It's a little bit like the ancestral health and the ancestral food and movement. Movement. Uh, it just feels right when you're doing it right. It looks good. It smells good. The animals are happy. Like you don't have to be a farmer to tell when an animal's stoked. It's out running around and foraging and, you know, growing really healthy and active and all that stuff. So it's pretty instinctual, really. We're all agrarian, not more than probably four generations before us. Um, so it is, it's kind of in your blood. Huh. But Joel Salatin was a huge influence on us. Alan Savory mm -hmm. and the Savory Institute was a huge influence for us. And it goes back to that idea that like we can produce good food, but also be a net positive to the land and the environment. That was huge for me. The idea that this doesn't have to be taxing to the environment. It can actually be a super big positive and sequester carbon and build soil and all this cool stuff but it's all about how you do it. Right, right. So the how the how really matters. Yeah, my favorite new documentary that's going to come out, it's uh, it's called, it's not the cow, it's the how. And oh, the, cool. the concept behind that is like, you can have cows in a factory farm that put out so much greenhouse gas and they're so bad for the environment and all this stuff. Or you can run cows in a holistic management prairie system where you're actually restoring the land and like building soil. It's not the cow's fault, you know, it's the way that we manage them that's really that's really the deal breaker. Yeah, I had Bobby Gill on the podcast from the Savory Institute about six months ago, and we talked Very about cool. how um regenerative farming actually restores the land and in a way yeah. that in a way that vegetable only farming can't do. Exactly. So uh yeah, it's a really interesting topic. 
Well, one of the most interesting things to me is if you look back in, in the U.S. like 200 years ago, you have almost as many bison as you have cows here now. And so it's not people like to say, oh, yeah, we have way too many cows. You know, the greenhouse gas is like our landmass sustained that you know, hurt for eons, whatever you believe, millions of years, you know. Right. And if you look at where those bison were, which is in the Great Plains in the Midwest, that's where like the healthiest soil the world has ever seen. Right. I didn't just come like that. You know, it was the bison that were eating the grass, trampling the ground, fertilizing with their manure and moving to the next spot for a million years that built up that, that crazy, rich, black, healthy soil. Yep. So, yeah, like I said, it's not the cow, man. It's the way that they're managing. We're finally now learning what that really looks like in nature and being able to replicate that for us with chicken, but, you know, with cows and sheep and, and pigs and everything else, too. How do you do it with chicken? Because chicken is a different, it's literally a different animal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what's the... Actually, it's a different animal. Yeah. yeah. So well, how do you do that? What What does that look like in over the course of uh, a day, a week, a month? Yeah. So conventional is all stationary. And stationary is what we do not want. In, in nature, animals are never stationary. They're always mobile. They're on the move. So they're going to, you look at cows or chickens, they're going to eat the grass they're going to poop on the ground, and once the grass is pretty much gone and the, the land's soiled, they're going to move to the next spot. That's just like an animal would never stay in one spot right. in, you know, forever. So we just copy that system exactly. We always say, like, the closer we can get to nature, the better off we'll be. So what, do, raised, what do wild chickens do? I don't even know that I've seen a wild chicken. Is there such a well, thing as a wild chicken? Well, if you say somewhere like uh, Hawaii, uh -huh. um, you'll see them all over the place. Or if you go to somewhere, say like Thailand or Indonesia, they're, uh -huh. they're the red jungle fowls, like where chickens kind of came from. And we've bred them to grow faster and to be better tasting and stuff since then. But the same principles really do apply. So they're, they're omnivores as opposed to herbivores, which is your cows and sheep. So when we talk about like grains, a lot of times people say, oh yeah, you know, I want grain feed or like grass fed chicken. Uh -huh. That's not a thing. So like chickens are meant to eat grains. They're nice. omnivores. So they can eat grains. They have a special organ called a gizzard. They actually take those grains, they digest it, it sprouts the grain, and it stone grinds the grain to make it nutritionally available for their system. So like, I wish that I could eat grains like a chicken can, but I don't have a gizzard, you know? Right. So not, not it's all anyway. about the healthy grains and making sure it's uh, supplemented with grass and forages and bugs and insects and stuff. But the big idea on pasture bird is we're moving every single chicken on our ranch to fresh pasture every single day. Wow. So they're getting off of their manure. They're getting the fresh bugs and worms and grass and seeds and fresh air and flowers and sunshine and all this cool stuff that's really like a natural chicken diet. And then they would supplement them with the grains, but they're moving every single day. So they're putting that manure down to become fertilizer. And then like they're getting the fresh bedding and fresh food all the time too. And then what happens to the land once they've moved? Like, do, do, do you have a process that you put it through or does it just naturally come back to the way it was? No, it's a rest period, and it depends on your climate. So, like here in Southern California, it's dry and arid. So, we're actually not going to graze that again for another ninety days. So, you think like they're on it for one day, and then it rests for eighty-nine days after that. Wow. So that's where the manure absorbs down into the soil. The soil is like thriving on that manure. It's like the best fertilizer. You know, Monsanto couldn't come up with anything that good. <laughs> this is like nature's Thank fertilizer, God. man. Yeah, it's like the true good stuff. So it'll absorb down. It'll build up the organic matter in the soil, and then that. that soil will build a better grass crop the next year around that's what regenerative ag is like all about it's every year that we're out there it's getting better and better all the time right right now and how the other crazy thing is like fifty thousand chickens and you can walk on the farm it doesn't stink and that's because that's amazing, it's no yeah. station it's not stationary right so when you're like moving the manure around the field all the time you don't get that smell at all huh so how much space do you have to allot for each chicken? Like, do you do you, do you have like a square footage that okay, a chicken oh, yeah. needs this much space? Yeah, it's very it's very scientific, so it's mathematical, and it comes down to the manure load that goes into the soil. So right now, in our climate, we have a 720 square foot floorless house that the birds live inside of. So you think like it's got a roof, it's got sides on it, the sides roll up and down so the sunshine can come in and all that stuff. But they're they're living inside of that floorless house, so they're on the pasture it's not like they have access to the outdoors it's like they live on the pasture every single day huh. and there's 600 between five and 600 birds inside of each one of those houses and then that whole house with a truck we move it every single day to a new spot of ground so we're making sure that they get off of that manure they get all those fresh forages and all that good stuff but they still have protection from predators and hawks and owls and coyotes and like we know where the manure is going too and so we can ensure that they get off of that every day 
Do they go in and out of the house, or are they? Are they... No, they stay in the house. So, oh, like okay. with egg layers, a big a big difference between doing eggs and doing meat birds. The meat birds want to stay in the house, so they want to be near their food and water all the time. So it's all about providing them with fresh pasture every single day. And to do that, like you have to physically move those birds. With egg layers, they're a lot more active. They they don't get oh. big like a meat bird does. So you could leave that house in one spot and just open the doors and they can go out and they're going to go forage. Got it. But the meat birds don't really do that on their own. So you're mo- you're manually moving their housing every single so day. So do they just sit, do they they don't have nests obviously. They just sit on the ground. They just uh... They hang out on the ground and they go up on their perches. They'll run around and chase little mice or huh. you know bugs and worms that are in the soil and like flies and all that stuff. So they're super active inside of the house. Are there, um, are there the windows? Is, do they have windows? The oh, house? yeah, yeah. The whole sides totally roll up. If you go on our Instagram, just at PastureBird, okay. you kind of see what the setup looks like. It's it's pretty killer, man. It's a cool environment for them. And then the sunshine can come in through the sides in the morning, the evening, when a chicken would naturally be outside in the sun. Yep. And then they're going to be in the shade throughout the day because a chicken's like top, you know, top predator kind of animal. So it's going to get picked off by a host of different predators. So they right. want to be inside of that jungle cover during the day so we have the shade roof form during the day and then it's again in the evening where they get all that sun exposure is it, is it loud in there no it's quiet it's actually really quiet inside really? it's really? pretty peaceful inside of there yeah so they don't they don't make a lot of noise no not really if you stir them up if you walk in there and you start jumping around or something then they'll <laughs> get all ruffled and they'll start balking at you but for the most part it's quiet and peaceful in there and, and uh, it doesn't stink which is the weirdest thing because yeah like, that is weird that is weird if you ever cause... owned chickens before even 50 birds, if you leave them in one spot for a few days, like they're going to smell horrible. You know, right, it's a lot of right. manure. But when you're moving them every day, so you can walk in to 600 birds and like, I could have my lunch in there. You know, it's like no problem. <laughs> and uh, you smell the farm, but it's not like a nasty smell or anything. It's a it's a farm smell. Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's one of the reasons why, why my wife doesn't want to have a chicken coop in the backyard. Like I've, I've wanted some, some layers in the backyard. For sure. Because I eat eggs a lot. But um, yeah. She, I think now we tell people, man, even four chickens in the backyard, you've got to figure out a way to rotate them because they're going to be oh. on their manure and that's how they spread disease too. So right. if one bird gets sick, you know, they're eating their food off the ground, which is what we want them to do. Yep. They're kind of pecking through the other chickens manure. And if they're sitting there three, four days, six months, five years, right. that's right. a lot of buildup of antibiotic, you know, resistant pathogens, bacteria, all kinds of parasitic activity. So it's really important that we move them off that manure every day. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, do you ever? Oh, whoops! I thought I had all my. I thought I had all my text tones turned off. Why did that come through? <laughs> Notifications. Yeah. Do not disturb. Oh, there we go. Now, now it'll be off. I shut off everything else, but my computer. Um. Yeah, I apologize if mine does the same thing. I don't know. No worries. Um. Did you ever have a point at which the you were like, this is just not going to work? Like, as great as it seemed to be going, like, we got to throw in the towel. Like, this just won't continue. Oh, yeah. like, a, like, oh, I God. Mean, it, I never doubted the ecology aspect of it. So, like, that part works. I've seen soil get healed and, like, grow amazing crops from almost nothing using animal impact only. You know, no fertilizer or anything like that. But the business side of it's a whole different ball game. So there's yeah. a lot of places that, yeah, you're sustainable agriculturally or regeneratively and stuff. But if you're not business sustainable, then you're not going to be around. So you might as well not even bother with the ecology part if you can't sustain a business. So there was one point about a year in. So we started raising these birds outside. Everybody loved it. We were having a blast. Like it was cool. And we would buy about 500 chicks at a time. And usually we'd harvest 500 birds, but mm-hmm. What happened is about a year in, we'd buy 500 chicks and we went to harvest. We'd have like 300 birds or the next month we'd do 500 and we'd have like 200 birds that would actually go back into the freezer. And it was like, what the heck's going on? You know? So finally one night we just stayed up the whole night and we just saw these coyotes like pouring into the fence. Really? Like, like five, 10, 15 coyotes taking four birds each. And like, it wow. was brutal, man. So you were feeding, um, you were feeding the, uh, the wildlife in the area. Oh, they were like, fat coyotes man wow. Those things were like sumo coyotes yeah and uh we were just like man you know i was trained as a sniper commander in the marine corps so i'm thinking all right this is easy <laughs> we're gonna jump up in a blind i'm gonna plug away at these things all right, night and, like right. we're gonna fix the problem but the first night i'm sitting up there in the blind and i'm thinking dude this just doesn't jive like we're trying to <laughs> 
participate right. with nature and like right. take part in its bounty and all this stuff. And now I'm going to sit here and plug away at coyotes like wildlife. Good job. Right. You're right, going to kill right. wildlife that's for right. a career. Like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. And then you, well, then you got to find more snipers because you can't do that full time. So yeah, with yeah, 50,000 50, birds out there pretty soon. Imagine with 50,000 birds, how many snipers you'd need. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing my whole team. Oh my God. Yeah. So it just didn't, it didn't make sense, man. And, and I just, I'm sitting up there in the blind. I jump on Google and like, how are other farmers doing this throughout the country? Cause we, again, we had no experience. We didn't know what we were doing at all. Yeah. And there was this thing called livestock guardian dogs. And I was like, Oh cool. Like fight nature oh. with nature. Like, how's this going to work? You know? And there's these breeds four common breeds in the U S of dogs that they're not herding dogs, but they're actual guardians. So they'll sleep most of the day. And then they'll kind of wake up around dusk and they'll just patrol the fence. And huh. I was like, dude, even if this isn't real, like what a cool story, you know, I got to try this. So we yeah. bought a couple dogs off of Craigslist, literally. Are they, found, what kind like, of breed, what kind of breed are these dogs? So it's called a great Pyrenees is the most common one. That's huh. the one everybody kind of knows. It looks like a golden retriever, but it's all white, huh. really beautiful. And then Anatolian shepherd is the other one. So Anatolians from the Anatolian mountains in Turkey. Mm-hmm. And these breeds have been with livestock for 10,000 years. Like there's wow. stories of them, you know, BC times, like protecting sheep and they'd be up with the shepherds in the mountains. And that's really how the shepherds protected their flocks and stuff at night was these livestock guardian dogs. And so there's no training really involved. We bought the first dogs, kind of took them back from the Craigslist they world. Just, they just know, the they just know what to do. They just know what to do. Dude, no, here. So they instantly fell asleep. And we're like, oh, we got <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's we, send them back. Like, we just wasted our last 500 bucks. Like, we're going <laughs> out of business. This is it, man. We're done. Right. Uh, and sure enough, you know, sun, sun went down and they're four months old. They're like puppies. And they woke up and they just started walking around the fence, like sniffing out the fence, barking all night long at every little thing. Wow. And now in four years. Whoops. Lost your feed. Hold on. Did I lose you there? Okay, there we go. Yep, I lost you there for a sec. Yeah, I hope that doesn't keep happening. That's the... Let's see. Is that your phone cu- cutting in? Yeah, it's just a phone call coming in. I don't, I'm not sure how to turn that off. If, so. you, uh, if you go uh, into your settings and shut off cellular, because you sh- you're on Wi-Fi, right? Is that the... Gr- yeah, here we go. Yeah, it's the little green button. Perfect. Then the, then the Do I still have you? In. Yep. All right, cool. All right, perfect. Um, so these dogs just started patrolling, dude, completely on their own. We had no training. It was 100% instinctual, and they just started cruising around the property. And now, four years in since that day, and I think we have 24 dogs now between wow. all the different paddocks and properties and stuff. Uh, we haven't lost a single chicken to a predator, which wow. is pretty insane. Like, Wow. Literally, we owe the success of the business to like these dogs, which is pretty cool. That's incredible. And I'm not going to say the dogs have never eaten some of the chickens because they definitely have, but yeah, yeah. at least the coyotes aren't eating like an exorbitant amount anymore. Are the dogs, uh, I mean, is that a natural thing for the dogs to eat a chicken? Like, is that a normal thing? Or oh, yeah. Just- yeah. I mean, we, again, you look at ancestral health and the foods movement, like they're all ancestors of the wolf. Yeah, so they're yeah. definitely meant to eat a carnivore kind of 95% raw meat diet. Yeah. Um, and so our dogs, like we've trained them to delineate between a live chicken and a dead chicken. We don't want them chasing our live chickens around. Yeah, right. Um, but we can feed them chicken, or we can feed them, you know, beef, organ meats, and hearts and livers, and like off cuts of pork that aren't selling or whatever. So, yeah, the dogs like thrive on that kind of a diet for sure. Hey guys, sorry about the interruption, but I want to tell you about our sponsor, the Good Kitchen. Uh, I've been getting meals from them now for about six months. And it's one of the greatest gifts I've ever given to myself because I get a chance to eat meals at lunch without thinking about where I have to go to get them, that they're, they're delicious. They're sustainably sourced. They're organic. They are whole life challenge compliant. All I've got to do is open the wrapper, uh, dump the contents into a frying pan, which I I heat them up right over the stove, or sometimes I eat them cold and, um, and go to town. Uh, sometimes I've used them in emergencies with my son, Dashiell. He loves them. My wife loves them. And uh, there's no thinking required, no planning required. Boom, they're in my fridge. I get it delivered every two weeks via uh, FedEx. So if you haven't tried it before, I highly recommend you give it a shot. You can use, you can get 15% off your first order if you use the link, thegoodkitchen.com forward slash WLC, thegoodkitchen.com forward slash WLC. 
Now let's get back to the show. You know what I love about that story is how did it you were literally up in the up waiting to snipe one of the coyotes and you pulled Google out on your phone like it happened. For sure. Like For I sure. love yeah. that that it took you actually trying to solve the problem on your own and actually being engaged in doing and solving it in order to come up with the idea. You would never like you might not have ever had the idea to have the dogs had you not yeah, actually gone out to snipe yourself. Like Yeah. We always said this business has been like shoot, then point the gun <laughs> ever since the beginning, you know? Right, right. There was no books. There was no research that went into it. There was no internship where we went and worked on another person's farm for a while. All that stuff is great. I'm not saying it's a problem, but in farming, a lot of times people get caught up in trying to plan out exactly how it's going to look. And we just jumped in with a set of principles, you know, like we want to raise chicken as close to nature as possible. We want to provide like really healthy pasture raised meats that are raised outside of a factory farm setting. Yep. And from that, you know, like we're open to whatever that looks like after that. How, um, so when you, you keep saying we, was it your wife and you, was it your, oh, no. so, who, uh, who else is we? It was my two brothers-in-law and my father-in-law that started it together. And so we were all working full-time jobs at the time. I was a CPA. My brothers were uh, a high school teacher <laughs> and then a med school student. And then my father-in-law was a contractor. So it was like, wow. Like the, the what was it, the village people like <laughs> just such <laughs> random like <laughs> not anything useful backgrounds and then all of our wives too like so random dude Pilates instructor my wife's an interior designer we have somebody who rolled out a skincare line a teacher just no ag background but like yep. honestly because this is so outside of the box and outside of what's normal I'm glad nobody went to ag school or came from an ag background because it almost makes it harder when your dad and your grandpa did things a certain way yeah. and yeah. changing that way is almost like insulting. It's saying that you guys did a bad job or something, you know, we don't have that. And so we actually have it a lot easier than a lot of the ag folks out there that are trying to transition from say feedlot beef to regenerative, holistically managed grass fed beef. Uh, that's because you got to undo a lot of stuff in order to change, in order to move into a new way of doing things. And you're almost like insulting those that came before you. Right, you know, totally. It's very hard. That's a very hard dynamic. I mean, you, I mean, you and I both experienced that in the Marine Corps. I mean, it's it, it's really really difficult to go into a new unit and establish new SOPs or protocols or whatever it is you want to do when sure. when they've been trained for years to do it a certain way. You yep. know, God, that's hard. Yeah, I mean, it's ingrained. It's like it's like easier to start from scratch almost than it is to take that and, and change it. But there are people doing it across the country. It's happening all the time. Sadly, a lot of times because they go broke, you know, doing it the conventional way, and it's just not working. You see is that it, is it harder? All the time, is it harder to make ends meet conventional farming than it is doing it the way you're doing it? Well, you just see people losing the ranch constantly now. It's really sad. You know, yeah. it's like the number one epidemic is just our nation's like farmer population is collapsing, and that doesn't surprise me at all because you look at these factory farms and the CAFOs and the feedlots and. I don't want to work in that environment. Like right. I would definitely right. would have kept my desk job if that was the alternative or yeah. I would have, you know, these kids, they grow up on the farm and it's hard work and it's kind of nasty and gross and it's the city life calls and you go be a doctor or a lawyer. Like why, why would you go back to that and make 20 grand a year? So right. um, I think the supply and demand is hitting now though, and it's going to be a hard one to keep up with. So to make ends meet, no, I mean, it's easier to probably do it conventionally because there's a template totally laid out for you. You can go plant 10,000 acres of corn and soybeans and you know the price you're going to get, you know who's going to do it. It's, it, you know, it doesn't, it takes a lot of hard work, but it doesn't take a ton of creative thinking and outside of the box. You just kind of do your thing. Um, to start a business from scratch and pioneer is way riskier, but way more fun too. Where did you get the uh, the that internal drive to want to tr take on an experiment like this? I mean, this is not something that everybody would just go and do. How, yeah, what? man, I, I I feel like a lot of the same stuff that drove us to to serve the, the country in the military is the same stuff that drove me to like do this. You know, I think uh, our country is at a crossroads with the way that we consume food, and that spans from meat all the way to plants and everything else. And I think um, we're we're really looking down the barrel of a pistol as far as like the health of our soil goes and the health of our people. And yeah, I think I got into paleo in 2007 along with CrossFit kind of at the same time. And just my worldview started to shift and you look at the way that the body was really meant to eat foods and to move and to sleep and to do all this cool stuff that you guys do in the whole life challenge. And like that transformed the way that I eat, the way that I vote, the way that I wanted to vote my life's passions to 
you know, this project of like providing a good welfare for animals, super nutrient dense food, like environmentally conscious, like regenerative agriculture. It just, it was the triple bottom line. Like I couldn't keep doing my desk job anymore. I was like hooked. Right. Right. When you, when you discovered that in uh, 2007, were you still in the Marines then? I don't, I don't know the timeline. Yeah. So I was actually just getting in. I was, I was first year lieutenant in, you know, the whole Rob Wolf and paleo solution and like all yep. that CrossFit was hitting the military hard right at that time. Were you, so were, I was right were, in there with that. It just, it made so much sense. You know, I'd never thought about food affecting the way you feel before. Yep. I've never thought of food like affecting the way you perform. And in infantry officer course, you know, it's a tough one and I'm lagging behind and I've got really sore knees and elbows and joints and all this stuff. And my guys that are exercising well and taking care of their bodies are flying past me. And it's like, man, I, I'm 22, all American athlete in college. Like these guys shouldn't be passing me right now. You know what's going mm -hmm. on. And so it just two weeks into paleo and I felt like a new person again and just, wow. uh, it was, it was a game changer for me and my whole family too. When you sh made that shift, because I remember back, uh, I didn't go to IOC. I went to uh, TBS, and then I went yep. to en combat engineer school. But um, yep. back when I did it, uh, our favorite thing to do was to leave base, go out the back gate uh, in Quantico, and uh, head to McDonald's and have chicken nuggets, <laughs> chicken For nuggets, sure, quarter man. powders. I mean, it was we would just stuff that stuff down, like because we could. Like there was, yeah. and and I didn't even think about. I did not ever think about the consequences that that that, that could have been bad. Yeah, totally. But even in the basic school, you start to go through some pretty rigorous activity and like, oh yeah, <laughs> I just felt such a difference when I took care of my body and eat and ate well compared to when I didn't. And yeah. to me, especially when you got to IOC, which was even more demanding in a lot of ways, yep. it was all the difference in the world, you know? And then you start having children and taking care of somebody else's diet. Then it gets real, you know? It's like, yeah. this isn't just about me anymore. Like, I got to try to give this kid the best chance that they can. Right. And then it gets really real. And what happened is even after going paleo started putting the right types of foods into my body, I started learning more about the quality of foods. And so trying to buy free range meats and cage free and grass fed and organic and all this stuff. And the deeper we dove, the more we realized it's just marketing jargon. I mean, it's literally BS. Yeah. Um, and that pissed us off to the point of buying 50 chicks for ourselves to basically put in the backyard. So do you today, where do you get your eggs from? Like, do you have layers that you guys, your family eats from? We, yeah. So we're, we're a broiler meat chicken farm. Yeah. That's our main focus. But we have about 200 layers on the farm. So it's enough for us and our employees and friends and family and stuff like that. So right. yeah, I, I produce my own. Um, but what I always say on eggs is to get to know the guy at the farmer's market, ask him good questions, ask to see pictures of the farm, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, yeah, we go to, I think my wife gets our eggs from whole foods and, uh, she always buys the expensive ones, but from what you're saying, that doesn't, shouldn't, that probably doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that they're good because they're expensive, right? particularly yeah. at, whole, at whole foods. They're yeah. like the big ones on that. So they'll mark something up and they'll put pretty branding on it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. we all fall for it. I mean, we're all human beings. Like we're all just trying to do our best, but that's really where it pisses me off. So Factory farming serves its place. It's cheap food for the masses. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that just try to get by, you know, and that's like, I totally get that. And it's fine. If you're being transparent, you're doing factory farming and just trying to produce cheap food. No problem. Like do your thing, you know, uh, what, what bothers me though, is the people like you and me that are trying to do right by our family and our kids. And you've got kids that are going through crazy issues now and they're dealing with autism and, you know, cancer and all these things. And like, you're trying to put the best, food possible into these kids bodies and you're paying for labels you know and it's like yeah. hard-working people like you and me that it's not like just expendable income like we're sacrificing to put this food on our plates and that's what really started to bother me the most was the idea that these big corporate companies are slapping labels on stuff and it's not any different than what you'd find you know at costco or walmart or whatever and it's just i don't know man that's what sparked the fire for us like we got to do we got to make the change just for our family yeah. And it turned out that other people wanted to be part of that too. Now, is your family involved in this at all too? Like your I know your in-laws are all the big part of this business. Do they just think you're you've you you lost your mind when you did all this or well, like yeah, well, how dude, is, I mean, how has your family been part of it? Part of the journey. Supportive, of course, but like we're from Seattle, you know, we're from <laughs> urban area. So for right. for me to even go into the military it was like, dude, what are you doing <laughs> now farming? They're like, you've <laughs> lost your mind, man. <laughs> oh, you didn't come from a long, 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 long line of uh, of, of former Marines? Yeah, no, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you go to college? 
Uh, we did undergrad at, at Concordia University down here in Irvine. Oh, okay. So I just got tired of the rain and just like wanted to get out and, and did undergrad down here. And then I went back after the military to UCLA to do my MBA. Oh, cool. Um, cool. And had a good time up there. And yeah, I love school, man. Lifelong student kind of thing. But it's good to get out and make some money too. So um, I want to ask you this question. In terms of your journey, um, who who's had the most profound impact? Is there one person? Is there multiple people? Yeah, man. I mean, I would say the two biggest ones in this space are Rob Wolf was the first one to open my eyes completely and to just be like, I remember that Paleo Solution podcast, man. I was like yeah, a, yeah. I was an avid listener. And when you haven't ever thought of things that way before, he's got a way of breaking down a complex subject and bringing it into layman's term. I'm not a scientist. I'm not, you know, I can't think in that way, but he had a way to break stuff down to the point where it's like, man, that makes an insane amount of sense, you know? And then on the more farming side, it was Joel Salatin, who was just a really the same way of just providing this template of like, when you move animals across a field, when you follow nature's lead, like when you look at it as don't try to cram, you know, a system into your box, like let's try to figure out a system that fits into nature's way of doing it. And we're going to be a lot better off in the long run. Right. A uh, huge impact. Two other guys that are like more random for sure. One guy is named Dave Ramsey. He's a big uh, he's financial, a financial guy. guy. Yeah, he's a financial guy. Yeah, yeah. big debt free. Just uh, and he has some business stuff, but some personal stuff too. And just the idea of like trying to avoid debt at all costs and to try to grow stuff a little more organically. So we didn't ever take the USDA loans. Or, you know, the military veteran. You can get a big fat loan to start a business. And I'm glad we didn't, man. Honestly, I think starting without the crux of like having that huge payment hanging over our heads and being able to like really focus on reinvesting profits to build the business in the beginning, that was huge for us. Yep. And then another guy, just uh, again, random, but a Christian pastor called Mark Driscoll. Hmm. He's out of Arizona and kind of out of Seattle where I grew up too. And just the way that all those things that kind of came together all at once to kind of form like the pasture bird, the primal pastures wow. idea of like, let's attack this thing, you know? Was that connected to when you had your first child or when you got married? Like, was there any other life events that occurred around the same time? Well, my whole family sort of like took paleo on shortly after I did. And my father-in-law, I mean, he lost about a hundred pounds without changing wow. lifestyle stuff, just on diet. And, uh, what were, what were some of the big paleo. changes he made? Like what were some of the big things he cut out or, or added in? I would say we all pretty much started on paleo and then we sort of like riffed off of that, you know, Weston A. Price or keto or like, but it's all pretty much comes back to the idea of ancestral eating. Yeah. But what did, um, what did they so, let, what did you guys let go of? And, and like, what were you eating before that you had to, that your dad say eliminated or your yeah. father-in-law eliminated, you know, that he was. I mean, breads and pastas were a big part of the diet for sure. Uh -huh. I'd say dairy, like milk was a huge part of the diet. Uh, sugar even though we weren't like fiends on sugar or something, but you know, you don't realize in a normal like American life, how sugar is just in everything, yes. like yeah. everything, yeah. high fructose, corn syrup, refined sugar, all this stuff. Um, legumes were kind of like a big one that was bothering quite a few people in the family and not really knowing it, but just getting that leaky gut mm -hmm. kind of thing figured out. Um, beer, you know, like we all enjoy beer here and there still, which yep. is fine, but, uh, having that, you know, two, three beers a night kind of thing. Like that really starts to add up on you after a while. Yeah. I remember so, back in the old days, uh, beer, like if I had suggested that I at one point would like to drink Corona light more than I like any other beer in the world, <laughs> I would have laughed you right into oblivion. Like, yeah. come on, get the hell out of here. But now like so, the only beer I really drink, cause it's really super low in, um, in gluten and mm -hmm. it's super light. Like it's one of the only beers that I actually enjoy to drink. So I'll, that'll oh. be the beer I look for Corona light. <laughs> there you go. Nice. I like that. There you go. Spend your money on chicken. Save your money on beer. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really interesting how that all kind of came together around the same time and uh, how the results you guys got. Like, that's really, really remarkable. Well, and we're in the right place at the right time, too. Like, I don't want to make it sound like it was us just being awesome. Like, we're in Southern California. Right. right. Unbelievable place to start a farm. You right. Know? Like, right. Uh, Joel Salatin says, you know, there's pros and cons to any place you want to start a farm in the world. Uh -huh. The cons here being the land is like insanely expensive. Yep. Regulations are super high. So zoning has been an issue for us. Like we've gotten in some big trouble in the past. 
not really knowing. We didn't know any better and just get the wrist slapped. And then it's dry. Like we don't really get rain here. So you talk about pasture raised livestock in Southern California. It's almost like an oxymoron because it's just dry as heck. Um, but the advantages are I got 22 million people within 90 minutes of the farm. Right. Right. We've had 12,000 people out for tours in the last five years. Like wow. we can distribute so quickly to all these amazing restaurants and like consumers that do really want to eat better food. They don't realize that they're not getting better food a lot of times, but you know, a lot of, I'd say everybody that's out there trying to buy free range and organic chicken, like they think that they're getting what we do and they're really not. Um, but you have a lot of people that want to buy the, the right kind of food and support a healthy environment stuff. So like being here in 2012, when we started the farm, like, I mean, it was gnarly, but it was like, we're one of the only farms down here, which is pretty insane. How many other people do what you do around the country? Like, is this a thousands? You know, oh, oh, re- yeah. oh, really? Same in the same way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or similar, similar like, ways. Obviously, yeah. It's not the same. I'm not going to say the exact same, but right, like daily right. moves. So we're moving the chickens every single day. We're rotating the sheep and the cows using electric fencing. Mm-hmm. They're only the cows are only getting grass. You know, no grains, no feedlots, no pellets, none of that stuff. They're only eating grass off the ground. Um, the chickens are like moving every day. They're getting no antibiotics or drugs or vaccines. There's, you know, organic feed on one program, really good, high quality feed that's not organic on another program. Um, but like really, really something you wouldn't find in the grocery store that's happening across the country. It's a huge movement. That's like sweeping the country right now at a really small scale, which is what's holding it back right now. So like, right. you know, when you go to the store and you can find a chicken for eight bucks in the, in the supermarket, it's kind of hard to justify paying 25 or 30 bucks for the kind of bird that we do. Uh, and, and that's all due to scale. So you've got a million right. people doing it at a right. really small scale. Our idea was like, let's try to scale this up a little bit. Uh, try to bring prices down as much as possible to get it more accessible to the normal person. And and tell me about that side of the business. So you guys, what? How do you supply the people that you supply? And what is your reach? And how do people who who gets it? Because you you're not a direct to consumer um, right. retailer. Yeah. So here's what's a trip, man. There's nine billion chickens slaughtered for meat in the U.S. every single year. Wow. So like we'll do about 250,000 birds this year. And that's not even considered a small farm. That's considered like a micro scale wow. farm. <laughs> so a small farm in California is doing maybe 500,000 or a million birds a week, you know? And a so week. like, I mean, it's just a huge industry. Wow. Every day in Southern California, there's $400 million spent on food. I mean, it's just unbelievable numbers when you get into the food industry and how big it really is and how many people are out there, you know? Right. Um, our reach is small because we're small, uh-huh. but it's bigger than anybody else doing pasture raised poultry. So like we sell to maybe 40, 50 different restaurants around Southern California, Northern California, Arizona. We sell nationwide through a couple different retail partners. We sell through crowd cow, through primal pastures for, through vital choice seafoods. Um, you know, we distribute the product fresh or frozen, depending on what market it's going into a lot of different parts and pieces or whole birds. Like, the business is definitely complicated when you start to get into it and dive into the weeds. But um, yeah, I mean, we've been lucky that chefs are now kind of coming around to this idea that like the cool thing is it actually tastes better too. So the animal yeah. doesn't grow as fast because they're out exercising all day long, every single day. So they're burning a lot more calories, but mm-hmm. because they're living on the pasture, they're getting like grass and bugs and seeds and worms and all that natural chicken diet. So that develops like this really rich old school flavor. So now it's getting picked up by a lot of the best chefs, you know, in California because they like the flavor of the bird and the story and like the ecological aspect of it matters to them where I would say 10 years ago, it would have been a pretty tough sell, you know? What are some of the most famous restaurants that use you guys as your, as your supplier, as their supplier? Yeah. I mean, our first two wholesale accounts ever were the LA Lakers and the LA Dodgers. So the team chefs came in with their nutritionists and they were like, I know you guys don't sell wholesale, but like we're feeding these you know players and we're paying them $5 million a year. Like yeah, we want to have what good- is it for us to pay an extra 50 cents a pound for a good meat, you know? Yep. Uh, so Dr. Kate Shanahan, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She nope. was, she floats around the LA scene quite a bit, but she's a nutritionist and she was a team nutritionist for the Lakers. So she kind of came out and she's like, no, this is what we're committing to. So we started working with them. Wow. Then the Dodgers came right after that. And then Wolfgang Puck's a, a good client of ours. Uh-huh. Um, Morton's and Mastro's are big restaurants in, in LA and in Southern California. Um, 
lots of like smaller restaurants that are hot LA kind of joints that are, that are using our stuff now. So yeah, it's been, it's been really cool to see like grass fed beef has been a tough one, right? Because a lot of people don't think it tastes as good as grain fed beef. Right. My wife, my wife has a hard time eating grass fed beef. Like she won't, she's, exactly. she's not a full convert. Yeah. And it's like, you want, you get it. It's better for you. The mm-hmm. omega three, six ratios dialed. It's better for the environment. It's better. But if it doesn't taste good, right. Kind of a hard sell, man. Like, yep. yeah, yep. I, I, I get it. But she'll do the, she'll do the ground beef, but she doesn't do the, she won't do the steak. So, I get that too, yeah. because it doesn't marble out quite as nice and yep. you don't get that same nice tenderness to the steak. So now I say that there are people now that have figured out how to do grass fed beef the right way and they're yep. finishing it as good or better than feedlot stuff for sure. Right. But you can also find really bad quality grain fed beef out there or, or grass fed beef. Yep. Chicken though is cool because it's a lot more consistent. So like it tastes as good or better pretty much no matter what as a, as a factory farm chicken. Oh, that's cool. That's great. Um, yeah. And, and I don't know that I've actually, I would, I don't know that I would know whether I've actually had what would be considered like a bird, like your bird, because I, yeah. how would I know? I buy them from with a label that has, you know, I mean, I've done some crowd cow stuff before. I don't know if I bought chicken okay. from crowd cow. Hey guys, sorry for the interruption again, but I want to tell you that the podcast This podcast lives and breathes based on your willingness to share it. If you are getting something out of this episode or out of any of the stories that we share, please do me a favor, do the world a favor and share it. Share it in your social media, share it on your Instagram or on your Facebook. Snap a screenshot of you listening to a certain episode and put it up on your Instagram. I'd love to see it. Tag me and I'd love to see it. Um, Put it up on Twitter. Um, you know, it, it doesn't just help me, it it helps me get better guests, which serves you, but it helps other people get to learn from the knowledge and inspiration and amazing stories that these people, these people have to share. Um, if you're so inclined and you're willing to go to iTunes to leave a review, I'd super, super welcome it. Obviously, (laughs) um, you can easily get there with the bit.ly link bit.ly forward slash Andy Petronic podcast, and that'll take you right there to iTunes, and you can leave a review there, hopefully a five star, and leave your thoughts. And yeah, I just really appreciate you guys. I really, I'm really grateful for being able to bring you this and do this for you. So there you have it. Let's get back to the show. In fact, I'm sure I haven't because most of yeah. the chicken we get, we get from. I don't even know where we get our chicken from. Should start finding this out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all like levels. It's like an onion, man. It's this yeah. whole world where it's like, all right, you got the thing now. We want to like feed our body the best ingredients possible. And it's going to affect the way we feel and perform and all this stuff. But then you peel back one onion and it opens up a new truth and then the next truth. So like we talk about meat labeling all the time because you can walk into the store and see free range and you think, oh, yeah, like it's got, you know, free range. That must mean it's outside. Mm-hmm. Now, the reality of like the free range label, though, is access to the outdoors is what's required by law you mean capable or, of seeing or c- could get out there if they wanted to maybe or technically they could go outside as uh-huh. long as you open a door so like we should back up so 99.999 percent of the chickens in the u.s and in what developed countries are raised indoors uh-huh. in what's called a barn so a grow house 600 f- feet long 40 feet wide forty thousand so birds inside of there you know wow. you've seen the pictures like yeah. that's what it yeah. looks like that's your sort of standard chicken barn. You take a door at the very end of that house and you open it for two hours a day. You know, the chickens aren't going to go outside. First right. of all, they're meat birds. They want to stay close to the feed and the water and the shade. Yep. So no matter what, it's 110 degrees outside Fresno, you know, no food or water or shade out there. As long as you open that door though, they had access to the outdoors. So now that's free range. Wow. So now we can charge, an extra dollar a pound for the meat, you know, two bucks a pound, a, do- a dozen for the eggs. Why wouldn't you do that as a, as a big marketing company right. yeah, of course. that runs these farms? Then you have like organic, you know, you think organic. Well, in my mind, leading up to this, that should mean same thing. Like chickens are outside. They're not getting any pesticides or drugs or any of that stuff. Not really, man. So like those birds. Lost you for a sec. You there? Your cellular trick didn't work for it didn't, me. It didn't work? How, how are you getting phone calls with your cell Maybe I pushed off? the wrong thing. It's oh. the little, uh, it's like the antenna with the little things coming off of it, right? Yeah, yeah. Unless you have your phone set up for Wi-Fi calling. Maybe it, maybe it, maybe you're getting Wi-Fi calls. Yeah, I don't know. 
Well, I'll just hope they don't call back. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah, so I mean, our organic chicken's like not any better. It's the same idea as free range. So the chickens could live inside of this thing 24-7, 365, never see the light of day. You know, they're either going back and forth from the grain to the water. They're pumping them full of all kinds of, you know, organic approved subtherapeutic antibiotics and stuff that, you know, that, that are approved under that system. And it's just a bad life. I mean, if you walked into an organic chicken farm, farm manufacturing facility, really, uh-huh. yep. you would not know any difference from a conventional one. And that wow. I think is not what people uh, expect when they see organic. Yeah, it's funny because last night we went to Whole Foods. We we just got back from a trip to Chicago and we were gone for 10 days and we had nothing in the fridge. So we went out last, we went out, I, I made a salad for my dinner and uh, I, I usually don't go to the store to buy eggs. So I'm looking through the eggs and we normally get these uh, dozen eggs that ha- that are, you know, I don't, they, they have a certain color. The label's like brown. I don't, I don't yeah. know what that means, but whatever. They're organic and they say, you know, um, I don't even know what they say. I don't remember now what they say, but I, but I noticed this other packaging that was, uh, they were, they came in 18 eggs and they're, instead of being a, 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 a typical like cardboard 12, you know, dozen eggs, it was 18 right. and they were, and it was, um, like a see-through like plastic, which I don't really like, but the, yeah, right. but it had really fun artwork on it. And the artwork yeah. all said pasture raised and farm, yeah, right. you know, like all these. And I had these, this, this vision of these nice, happy little chickens running around and laying their eggs and pulling the worms out of the ground. The early bird gets totally. the worm, the whole thing. Yeah, and, for sure. And, uh, now I'm, I feel duped. <laughs> well, potentially, not potentially I mean, I'm not, duped. I'm not saying that they're duped. all fake. Right. Uh, I guess right. what I'm saying is that they can easily be manipulated. You know, yeah, they, right. they often are. So that company, I'm pretty sure you're talking about Vital Farms eggs. Uh, oh, they've made a pretty good dent on this pasture raised egg thing. And the idea of pasture raised is supposed to be that the chickens are living outside. Not that they have access to the outdoors, but that they like actually live outside. So mm-hmm. what I would say is I've seen folks that call themselves pasture raised that don't have a blade of grass. I've seen free range that never goes outside. I've seen antibiotic free that actually got antibiotics its entire life. Wow. Um, the, the bottom line is you just can't trust the label. Right. We've got to get really back to like trusting the farm and, yeah. and the actual source and knowing where your food came from. And it, the cool thing is it's easier than ever now. You know, the 21st century, I can go find, you can go find me online 24 seven and you can see I'm posting every single day pictures from our farm and videos and trying to get out there and do podcasts like this and actually, you know, virtually meet people if not in real life. And we've done, like I said, 12,000 people for, real life farm tours where you can come and actually in the military, we say inspect what you expect, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's what we have to get back to. These labels are all bastardized at this point. You can take advantage of all the loopholes and all that stuff. So, so if, if we all just really take responsibility to inspect or be our own inspectors, really, I mean, Absolutely. that's really, what, that's really what we're talking about. Like if, when you go Absolutely. to the farmer's market, talk to the farmers and talk to the oh. guys that are bringing the food and be willing to, it's going to cost more, but you know, like what, 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 um, what level of responsibility do you want to take for the food that goes in your body? You know, like- I mean, in reality, yeah, it may cost more, but it also may not too. Because hmm. when you develop that relationship, you know, with an actual farmer, maybe they have stuff that's not moving. Maybe they have some beef roasts that are just sitting in their freezer, and they want to get rid of them. And you know, those are just as packed with nutrients and filet mignon. You know, yeah. So you could go pick something up for cheap, or maybe you get to, yeah. You know, there, there's a million ways. Maybe you decide you want to buy a half cow. Because right. that's really right. the best and most efficient way to buy these meats. And you could get that for way less if you're going shopping at Whole Foods or yeah. Erewhon or one of these more upscale markets. Like, dude, you can you could probably buy it for 50% of what you'd buy it for at one of those places. So yeah, right. there right. are ways to do it on a budget and to do it economically. But you just want to make sure that you can trust where your food is coming from. And like Joel Salatin likes to say, you know, we live in an age where people spend 10 times as much energy figuring out who the mechanic is to fix their car than they will on the food that they're putting into their body that's you know insane. And I'm like that's, man, that's it's crazy it's, it's insane true. right like why do we care so much about our cars yeah when, when you look at your body like it just it's a question that has plagued me for 20 years since i got into the business of health and well-being and looking at people's bodies and you know somebody will make a 600 hundred dollar car payment and yeah, then they'll right. balk at at going anywhere except the the cheapest place they can get their dinner you know totally. like what or world? that home entertainment system or that extra bedroom on your house or that backyard remodel. I mean, it's all priorities. And that's one thing that totally shocked me getting into this is 
we set up our cost structure so that we'd be economically sustainable. You uh-huh. know, we're not, you know, we're not rich by any means, but like we're, we've been able to stay in business for six years because we set our struct- cost structure to a point where we can afford it. Yep. And I thought, man, this is expensive. Like kind of sucks. We're producing food for rich people. But back in the day, we used to make home deliveries. Like we'd actually drive to people's houses and drop the food off. And what shocked me was you're pulling up to small apartments, dude. Like you're pulling up to places with not very nice cars. Like the people that are buying this food are the ones that are really making a sacrifice to put good food in their body and putting that above other stuff. Right. It wasn't. I mean, to this day, we don't sell. It's not food for rich people by any means. It's like, what do you prioritize in your life? Yeah, because I, I think there are so many people that could afford a higher level of quality of food. It's just a matter of distribution and choices, you know. And absolutely, how do you want to make those choices? And um, and then under- and are you educated enough to know that like you don't have to buy the New York steak? That's going to be five times more expensive than the ground beef, right? You know, right? Stuff like that. You buy that whole chicken and learn how to just cut it, which can take thirty seconds. And you'll save right there. You save fifty percent on your on your grocery bill, you know, yep, yep. and uh, stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to get back to getting real food, but still, if you're on a budget, to to make it work. You know, um, I was going to say, given the level of success you've achieved, in, in, I mean, to a lot of people, to me, I mean, you're incredibly successful at doing what you're doing. How you. do you feel like? you're, you're still figuring things out. Like where, where are you not a success at this point? And what, what's, what are you working on next? Like how are, what are the, some of the struggles you're going through? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I think, uh, what we've noticed is there's a gap in the market right now. So there's a thousand people doing this at a tiny micro scale. And then it jumps up to a million birds a week. And like that disparity is a problem to me. Like nobody's filling that sort of middle market void with an actual good pasture raised product. So the problem is, especially with broiler chickens is like, nobody's done that. Nobody's crossed that bridge. Nobody's figured out how to do that. So at pasture bird, the whole idea was let's figure out how to scale this up to the point where we can bring prices within that whole sort of free range organic ballpark yep. so that the folks that want to get good stuff can actually get it. And it's distributed widely and you can find it in grocery stores. But what we found is like, it's a technology gap. We don't really have the technology to produce 500,000, a million birds a week on pasture in a daily move system. So we're like, what, in the what kind of te- of- when you say technology, do you mean just like knowing how to do it? Or do you mean actual like, like hardware and software and technology, technology? Legitimately hard hardware and software is going to have to come into this. And that's huh. what gets us excited too, is like, okay, we can move 600 birds with a truck and we can fill it up by hand with buckets and stuff. But like, we're never going to (laughs) touch the efficiency of the big industry doing everything manually. Right? (laughs) How do we automate some of this stuff? Like, how do we make this work at scale? So I'm literally working with PhDs and NASA scientists and like trying to figure out what does the future of chicken sort of look like in this regenerative non-drug way? Because another big thing that we're running up against is antibiotic resistance, you know, super bugs. When we're using these subtherapeutic human grade antibiotics in a lot of the chicken production that we do, your little kid's going to go into the hospital and all of a sudden they got MRSA and it can't be treated because the antibiotics are resistant because they've been injecting or they've been consuming products that have had like tons of antibiotics in them. Yep. Huge problem. And it's like coming to a, you know, huge spike right now. And if you look at the charts, antibiotic resistance is a major one that we're going to have to deal with in the next 10 years. Yep. So we think that there is a future at a large scale pasture based poultry and beef and pork and everything else. But like we're figuring out how do you even do that? You know? And that's I mean, what's, do you think some of it, right do you think some of it is in autonomous cars like, or, or, you know, obviously not cars, but uh, like tractors or is that one of the problems uh, moving these, moving these things around? Like what are some how do of the you move? Yeah. I mean, how do you move 30,000 chickens at a time to fresh <laughs> pasture? Right. Like that's insane. You know, if you went right. out and you saw what that would look like, it just doesn't exist right now. So like we're having fun solving those challenges and figuring it all out. And even there's still like some, you know, secret sauce kind of confidential stuff that we're working on. We're like stoked about, you know, oh, cool. Uh, but what does the future of poultry really look like to me? It's not stationary. It's mobile. Yeah. And like, we're yeah. excited to roll that out and show that that can be done at, at a large scale. I, I think it's really cool too, that you're, you're having to, you're, you're relying on dogs. I mean, like talking about a low tech, 
you know, you're, you wouldn't yeah. have a business without dogs, period. Totally. Like you would not, yeah, gnarly, man. you would not exist. So like yeah, a, day, a farm with like, 30,000, you know, you, you got 50,000 chickens, so a farm with 5 million chickens, how many dogs would you have? It's going to be you know? crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there'll be section of worth. There's all the challenges that we're thinking through right now. It's crazy. You, you need farmers to take, you, I'm not farmers, but you need dog handlers to take care of all the dogs because it's a whole nother business <laughs> inside your farm. <laughs> what was the quote? Uh, the, the machine of the futures, like a, a man watching the machine and a dog watching the man to make sure you, the man doesn't touch the machine. Like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, what are some of the ways, because it sounds like you have a lot going on. What are some of the ways that you keep yourself organized? Like, how do you keep all this stuff together? Do you use your CPA skills? Do you use a computer? Sure. Do you have apps you use that are your favorite go-to to keep all this stuff together? Yeah, I mean, no doubt. Like, thankfully, we're doing this business in the 21st century and there's so much tech that's applicable to what we do now i couldn't imagine trying to keep the paper records and stuff that a lot of the farmers are still doing across the country it's yep. brutal you know like i mean it's sad when i see it and, and they're spending a lot of time and energy on this stuff that's just so easy to automate now um but we've also built a team dude like that's probably my biggest thing is we started out with just family yep. and when you come from a non-farm background and you get into farming especially livestock it's seven days a week, man. Like yeah, yeah. it was the most eye opening, like revolutionary thing to me ever of it's cool for like a month or two or three months. And then pretty soon six months has gone by and you've worked every single day, like right, right. not taking a break. Like, and then a year goes by and you still never taken a single day <laughs> off. And it's right. like, dude, this is insane, you know? So finally we got to the business to the point where we're able to start hiring one guy, then two guys and then three guys. And pretty soon, like, finally go on a vacation kind of thing and like that's been cool to look at this not just as a farm which is romanticized and like people will take a loss at it because it's really fun yeah but more is like let's look at it as a business that needs to be sustainable financially and even socially like it's not fair to my family to have to work seven days a week for two years straight like we need to be able to have friends and go out and like kids need to be able to play sports and stuff yep uh can't just be all consuming otherwise it's going to come to a crashing halt so right. Building a team has been like everything for us. What are some of the literal ways you guys c communicate? Like some of the internal, do you use Slack? Do you, do you use spreadsheets? Do you use Google Docs? Like what are some of the methods you guys have come up with that you use that work well for your team? Yeah, kind of like Slack. My whole team's on front. Um, oh, what's that? I mean, we have field guys that don't even have internet, dude. Like yeah. Yeah, some yeah, yeah. of our guys are just rad country people that are like, I'm like, yeah, I need your email to like sign you up for payroll. And you're like, sorry, bro. I like, <laughs> don't even have it. You know, I'm like, I respect that, man. That's right, cool. Right. <clears throat> but the, the people that are running the business side of it, we're all on front, which is kind of like Slack. We use MailChimp for all of our email stuff. We use Shopify for all of our e-commerce. Uh -huh. We use QuickBooks. Like I'd say a pretty normal stack for like a normal e-commerce business. Yep. Um, just applied to farming, you know, and it, it all works. It's all the same. It's all business. That's cool. That's cool. We're all so, on Apple. Like, yeah, it's a, it, we, you know, we're all iMessaging every day and we're on uh -huh. Google Drive and iCloud and Dropbox and all the same stuff as everybody else's. Do you work insane hours? Do you work farmer's hours where you're up at four o'clock in the morning and you're doing, you know, and then you're out, you're last one to bed or like, how do you manage your life today? Yeah, man. I mean, uh, again, we have a team, so I don't yeah. have to be out there doing chores every single day. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. I was out there doing them this morning, but that's a rarity at this point because the guys honestly are better than, at it than I am now. So right, like, right. they'll be like, dude, like get out of here. <laughs> you don't even know what you're doing anymore. We've passed you up like long ago. Right. Uh, because I'm out, I'm selling the product and I'm the one that's doing all the accounting. Cause you like got, HR. you have your job to do too. Right. I mean, it's like, it's, yeah. it's like anything else. I mean, like it's like the Lieutenant that tries to go in and do the Lance Corporal's job. And exactly. really that's not your job to do the Lance Corporal. You, you need to know what he does, but, you, but you need to do your job. Well, and if, if that Lance Corporal's not better at me than you know <laughs> basic rifleman skills yeah you got big he problems. needs to be like that's yeah. a problem yeah yeah um so no man i mean i do work crazy hours but i think i'm just the personality that would no matter what i'm doing like i'm gonna give it 150 percent no matter what so i'm more of a night owl so like <clears throat> i've got young kids right now so usually i take the mornings kind of easy and then work usually starts at eight or nine and take a little break in the evening to try to hang out with family. And then it's kind of back to the grind, you know, two, yep. three in the mornings, like the normal oh, wow. routine for wow. me. So you don't get a lot of sleep. Uh, I should get more for sure. That's yeah. like a, that's like a gap in my life, but I also feel like it's a season with young kids where right. 
Right. I just really value that time with my family. And like, I'm not willing to just power through and I'd rather okay. just stay up late for a few years. Yep. Um, but no, I mean, I, I fully support everybody sleeping, put it that way. I'm a big fan and a proponent of that. But for me, six hours or seven hours is, uh, it's sustainable. So yeah, yeah, that's cool. Do you, uh, do you work out these days? Man, I was, uh, I, I'm a CrossFitter. So like I was CrossFitting maybe three days a week. And then uh-huh. I'm also a big beach volleyball player. So I try to play oh, cool. a day or two a week, something like that. And then, you know, just walks with the kids and the family and just in farming in general, like you're getting some pretty good exercise in. And then I was coaching volleyball for a little while and I haven't been crossfitting for like the last month. So I'm feeling like a complete skunk right now, dude. Like I need to get back to it. I'm completely jonesing because you got to get that in. It's also tough to go back. Like the first day, you know, cause you know how much it's going to suck. Oh man. You, you know, know like, you, yeah, it's I'm horrible. dreading it, man. Yeah. I know for sure. Yeah. You just gotta, you just gotta do it. Like, uh, I, cause I've gone through all kinds of, you know, ups and downs in my, in my crossfitting and then not crossfitting and then crossfitting and then not crossfitting and, Man, they're, they're, they're just coming back to whatever it is you're going to come back to. It's just yeah. you know it's going to suck for a little while. I'm stoked though out here. I mean, it's a, it's not a big town or anything. It's about a hundred thousand people total. But are you in Redlands? Some, are you in where, where whereabouts is the farm? Temecula is the Temecula. town oh, where that's we're right. going to live. Right. Murrieta's right next to it. Do you, but do you happen to know the Gravats? Do you know Jordan R- Gravat? And Paul oh yeah, Gravatt? for sure. Yeah. So that he, whole J- family. So I think I wear the shirt incinerator. Nice is Jake Worthington and the Gravat guys. And yeah, that's, that's my box. And oh, then cool. they just transferred over to turn Two CrossFit. And ever since they transferred, like I haven't gone in and it, not because I don't want to, but same thing, dude, probably deep down. I'm like nervous about going back. Cause I know I'm going to do those pull-ups and you get that thing, the dinosaur arms, and dinosaur just, arms, T-Rex, T-Rex arms. It's coming, man. So uh, Jordan, Jordan does in. all our video stuff. So when we oh, shoot yeah, for our, sure. nice. our stuff, he comes He's out and we'll, do, we'll shoot for, we'll shoot for half a day and we'll shoot like 12 videos or 15 videos. And then he goes back and edits them and gets them out to us. So He's a cool. beast, dude. I love that guy. He's a good CrossFitter too. He's actually yeah. a super good coach. And Have you ever heard his Jake. daughter sing the national anthem? No. Oh my God. She is really? unbelievable. She did it for, actually, I think she did it for the first CrossFit games in, um, in Carson when they had, no the, they had way. a flyover. They did a whole thing. She's amazing. Yeah, Whoa. I think she. I think I don't know what she's doing. I don't know if she's in music school or, or kind of what she's up to. But um, I'm going to see Jordan on Wednesday. What day is today? I'm going to see him tomorrow. Wow. No way. We're shooting videos tomorrow, so I'll I'll uh, let him know that we spoke. Yeah, man. Please do. Yeah, tell him. Tell him I'll be in soon. I've been. I've just been. Uh, I've been lazy to be honest. <laughs> I don't think it's possible for doing what you do <laughs> to be, to be lazy. That those two things don't go together. Yeah. So what's um. Uh, going forward, what's your, I I know you've already talked about the technology stuff. What is your purpose mission? Are you more dad? Are you more, uh, more business? Are you a little bit of both? Like what, what do you see the next five, 10 years looking like? Well, right now it's just a, it's a major opportunity, man. Like I can't pass up this time with the technology that's like ready to go. And like the market that wants the product, that's probably the biggest thing is, yeah. People want it now, man. Like, and, yeah. and they're getting educated to what the differences are. And like that, I mean, they're, people are tired of being duped by labels and stuff. So I just think like we got to push on the gas for the next few years at least. And we would just want to leave a mark on agriculture that we can be proud of, you know? Yep. Like, I think if, if we can step away from all this 20 years down the road and like there is a viable way of putting chickens out on pasture and producing them economically for the average person to be able to get to and telling that story and educating about like, you know, regenerative agriculture and the way that animals can actually be a huge benefit to the ecosystem. And like some of these arguments, dude, I mean, it's all day with like the militant vegan idea that, Oh yeah, you're like, you know, so toxic to the environment. You're killing these innocent animals and like all this, we can talk about all that stuff too and it's all valid you know in a factory farm setting but it's also completely invalid when you look at like a regenerative setting so yeah right um if we can just educate too that's such a big part of all this stuff well uh i i'm fully on board i i love what you're up to and uh i really appreciate you spending the time uh on the podcast how how do people if people are inspired or maybe they live in la and they want to come out and see the farm in action how what's the best way to engage with you and see you yeah we try to post every single day on social. So we're just at pasture bird on Facebook and on Instagram. And then, uh, in the West coast, we have an online retailer called primal pastures. That's my family's business too. 
and that's all pasture raised chicken, lamb, beef, pork, wild seafood. Um, so you could buy the products there, but only really oh, cool. on the Western U.S. And is that like they deliver it to your door? It's a like a yeah. it's flash frozen, and then it shows up frozen at your door. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, uh, I hope to make it out. I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can uh, grab my son and maybe my wife and and bring everybody out. Well, there now you have to since things. we're like yeah, mutual totally, friends with totally. Jordan and all that. You got to come out. Well, and then you're gonna have to go into the gym and do a CrossFit workout. So uh. <laughs> I have to do that anyways, man. It's all right. We keep talking about, you should come down for this. We keep talking about doing like the farm games or something. We want to get a few different affiliates oh, out. That'd be awesome. And go like hit some some good, you know, hay bales and pig wrestling and everything else. You would crush that. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. I'd be all right with that one. Chasing, chasing chickens. You know, yeah. <laughs> Rambo having, style. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Paul, thanks again. Just hang tight. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut the live feed off, and then um, okay. and then we'll uh, touch base. Hang on. Hey, it's Andy, and thanks so much for listening. If you want to know more about what I'm learning each month, head over to andypatronic.com and subscribe to my monthly newsletter. If you were touched, moved, or inspired by anything you heard today, chances are someone else you know would be too. Please take a moment to think about who and send them a link to this episode. And if you're super stoked, please head over to iTunes to write a review. The best way to keep current on guests and episodes is to subscribe so that the latest one will automatically get delivered straight to your phone. The apps I use for this are Apple Podcasts, Overcast, or Pocket Casts. The Andy Patronic Podcast is produced by our team, Winslow Jenkins, Becca Borowski, and Ernie Hurtado. Big thanks to Nikki Grudadaria for the artwork. You can find all of our episodes, links, and complete show notes at wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast. I'm Andy Petronic. Thanks for listening.